Let's pray. And then, Father, and the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you're always present to us, Lord. You are closer to us than our breath. Help us to become aware of you more intimately than we could ever be aware of our own breath. Help us to know you never leave us. Give us the courage to always stand before you in humility. Help us to be committed to you in prayer that we may do your will. Jesus, fill us with your Holy Spirit, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. And let your Spirit set us on fire. We beg you these things, Holy Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. And the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, gentlemen, what we're going to deal with in the middle of Lent is what I consider... It's the core of what it is to be a follower of Jesus. If you don't have this, no matter how good you are, no matter how great things you do, you're not a follower of Jesus. It's just that simple. And so what it is, it's about being a man of prayer. It's just that simple. It's the most important thing. And so this is the second of the uh, what it is to be a 2232 man. He is a man who has a daily committed prayer life and is a man who has daily surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And it's important because the Holy Spirit in prayer is the same. We can't pray without the Holy Spirit. Huh? Uh, very clearly, Paul says, we do not know how to pray as we ought. That's everyone here. I don't care if you think you're a mega Christian. Paul says, the Holy Word of God says, we do not know how to pray. So, the Spirit himself prays within us. The Spirit comes to us and he lets us cry out, Father. Now, something for Catholics, one of the things that Catholics always do when they begin and end prayer is they begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There's a couple reasons for this. One is to remind us of the Trinity always in our life. When a Catholic enters a, a church, he usually, or she usually put their hand in some holy water and bless themselves to remind them of their baptism, who they are in Christ Jesus, to call Christ's blessing upon them that they may live a life worthy of Christ. And because what happens is when we invoke the Spirit, you know, of course the Trinity is this God of love. And we invoke the Trinity. When what the Holy Spirit does, if you will, is he picks us up and he brings us into the very center of the life of God. That's why we invoke the Trinity at the beginning and end. Huh? Now we do things in the name of Jesus, of course, but we remember that there's only one God and three divine persons. And we have to make sure that we invoke the whole Trinity when we come into God, we're being in relationship with the whole Godhead, right? You know, and that's why someone like Francis Chan, one of my favorite authors, who's a, uh, a Protestant minister, would write a whole book called The Forgotten God. And he focuses on the Holy Spirit as the forgotten God. That men don't know how to pray to him. People don't know how to pray to him. He's the forgotten one that we think, oh yeah, the Holy Spirit too. And yet every time we pray, we're entering into relationship. So we've got to remember that prayer is about relationship. And so relationship is what we build our life on. And again, just like any relationship, the way relationships grow, the way we get to know people is in prayer. There's no other way to do it. And if you're in love, then you spend time. Huh? Years ago, I was with, uh, you know, I've done a lot with high school kids. And so I was doing a high school talk up in uh, Cleveland. And it was an all-school assembly. And I was talking, I was trying to get the kids to talk about prayer. And I says, you know, the basic thing you got to do with anybody, if you're going to fall in love with them, was what are you going to do? I was trying to get him to say, spend time, which is that simple. Just that simple. But again, everybody has to be a smart ass. It's just the way it is. Huh? And so I sat there and this one kid there, he was a real, I said, son, have you fallen in love? And he goes, yeah, father. And I said, how can you tell you fell in love with somebody? Because I made love to her father. And I go, oh, after that 10 seconds, then what did you do? And he just embarrassed the hell out of him in front of the whole school. I kind of like it. Because the reality is that would exactly, if, if he thinks that love, 
is making love to somebody who he just met this girl. And again, in his 10 second reality, it has nothing to do with it. It is the thing you do at the end of love, that when you fall in love with someone, then you sit there and you carry that out physically. But you gotta spend time. You can't fall in love with anybody without spending time with them, huh? And so when it comes to Almighty God, some people are Christians, meaning that they, they do these Christian things. I've given my life to Jesus. Do you spend time with them? No. Well, it's garbage. It's just garbage. I don't care. Oh, because it's not magic. You see, this is what everybody, be you Catholic, be you Protestant. Anytime we think that our relationship with Jesus Christ is magic, we got a problem. There is no magic when it comes to God. Like anything else, it comes from relationship. And the only way relationship is anything is if we're committed to spending time with the person we're in love with. Huh? You sit there, and just because you got married to a woman doesn't mean you're in a relationship with her. Now, does it? You sit there and try how, how that's going to be. Now, honey, listen. I'm going to marry you, and I'm going to spend, oh, 45 minutes to an hour a week with you. And we're going to get all our conversation done at that time. And then during the rest of the week, I might call you on the phone every once in a while. But I'm a very busy person, you know. And I'll think about you every once in a while. And that's about it, sweetheart. Are you going to want to be with me? And if she's any kind of a woman, she'd say, you're a nutcase. I have nothing to do with you. And yet, people do this with God all the time. They go to church on Sunday or whatever. And they might go to God every day and have a little bit of time with him. But they're not having committed time. And so, again, the Old Testament talks about my people die from lack of discipline. Men die because they don't have committed time. And that just ain't laymen. Priests don't pray. Ministers don't pray. I promise you. I deal a lot with priests. I do priest retreats. And I often say, fathers, or if I've done minister retreats as I have, <laughs> reverends, you've got to pray. There's, no, there's nothing more I can tell you. If a person doesn't pray, I can't do anything with them. God can't do anything with them. And prayer is just giving God, God of the universe time. And everybody has it here, gentlemen, right? We've talked about it. We all have the exact amount of time. Everybody here. I don't care what you're doing with your life, what you're not doing with your life. You have the exact same amount of time as I do. So... What you love is what you give your time to. It's just that simple. So you can tell me all you want, you love Jesus. I love Jesus, I love Jesus. Well, good. Prove it. How much time do you spend with him every day? I don't. You don't love Jesus, you're a liar. I've given him my life. You're a liar, you have not. If you've given him your life, then you spend time with him, right? It's just that simple. If you sit there and you're in love with somebody, you're going to spend the time. So the biggest thing I want you to do before you leave tonight, gentlemen, is I want you to make a promise to Jesus that you're going to give him so much time here for the rest of your life, period. Huh? Now, I'll encourage you all, gentlemen, to start small. Huh? Five minutes a day. If you can't give God five minutes a day, gentlemen, there's a humongous problem, right? Because some of you spend more time on the toilet, don't you? You know, it's true. The older you get, the more time you spend there. And what are you going to do when you drop dead on Judgment Day? And he says, how come you spent more time on the toilet than you did talking to me? What are you going to say? You got to go, you got to go. Well, that's nice. But that's not a committed relationship. So again, you decide you're going to give him five minutes a day. And I've said this a hundred thousand times before here and a hundred thousand times wherever I go. You need to give God time. You cannot fit God into your day. You need to build your life around God. huh? Again, when I taught at prep, I'd sit there and say, son, did you pray yesterday? And I'd always get, no, father. Okay. Did you eat yesterday? Yes, father. You love food more than you love God. Did you pray yesterday, son? No, father. Did you watch television yesterday? Yes, father. You love TV more than you love God. Did you talk to your girlfriend yesterday, son? Oh, yeah, father. We did more than talk. <laughs> Did you pray yesterday? No, Father. You love your girlfriend more than you love Jesus. Huh? That's reality, gentlemen. You love what you give your time to. So, 
Do you give your time to Jesus? Now, let's talk about what happens when you pray. Prayer, again, is relationship. So, again, I believe that you can go through a relationship with somebody and never be present to them, but never being in relationship with them, too, because you do all the talking. So, biggest part of prayer is that we need to listen. You know, again, I do our prayer every day, and in my holy hour every day, since I was 17 years old, a lot of times I'll do a lot of talking. And then at the end of it, I get ready to, to leave his presence, <coughs> and he says, <coughs> why didn't you talk to me once today? Oh, I did a lot of talking. Yeah, I did. But I wasn't in relationship with the God of the universe. That when you and I go pray, we got to touch the throne of God. You know what it is to touch the throne of God? That I come and I go beyond just my prayers and the gimme, gimme, gimme. And I get out of myself for a minute, for a second. And I focus on him. Again, too often we come before God. It's about me, about my needs, my wants, my desires. A focus on, you know, God, you got to give me strength. God, you got to give me help. God, bless my family. God, I need some money. God, I need out of this. God, I need out of this addiction. God, I want, God, I need God, 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 God. And our whole focus is on self. And that's why we never get out of self. Because if even in the presence of God, we're still focused on self, we'll never be set free. So what has to happen is when you and I go to pray, is we focus on him. And it's very hard because people say, well, he doesn't reveal himself to me. I said, because you've never been still long enough, right? Remember the teaching of the Catholic Church is who made me, God made me. Why did God make me? God made me to know him, love him, and serve him in this world so I can be happy with him forever and next. How do I come to know God? Psalm 46, verse 10 or 11, depending on your translation. Be still and know that I am God. Be still means you've got to be still. And then you've got to be focused on someone else. Be still and know that I am God. Not you. I am. And so you're in his presence and you become still. And then one of the greatest things is when you go and you can stop looking at yourself for a moment. And you can look at the Father for a moment. Or Jesus for a moment. And you see the way the God of the universe looks at you. And how does the God of the universe look at you? With great love. There's no one on this earth who loves you the way God does. Nobody. And until you come to know that intimately. I was reflecting on this that I was preparing for the talk tonight. And I remember when I was, I came to Jesus at 17. And when I came to Jesus, I remember focusing on um, just I wanted to pray and so I would spend all this time in prayer at my grandmother's house before I entered seminary I remember sitting in a rocking chair one day and I'm, I'm just praying high school kid totally alone and then I became aware that I wasn't alone and then I became aware that I was intimately loved by the father I just had this sense of the father embracing me and loving me and here I am in high school, and I remember just the, the experience before I ever entered seminary, before I was doing anything big in prayer, before I ever spent all the time, the, this experience that God was real and that he cared about me. Well, that's how I could sit there and then enter the seminary. At 17, typical 17-year-old kid who has all the sexual energy as anybody else, I could say, God wants me to be a celibate. Huh? I'm going to be a virgin for God. Right? I couldn't be a virgin for God unless I knew I was loved by God. And that's still been, what, I'm 54, I'm going to be 55 next month. Still a virgin for God. I could never be a virgin for God without knowing that the emptiness inside of me and all of us is filled by Him. And so relationship's so important. And what that means then is I come before God empty-handed, knowing that he will fill me and give me what I need more than anybody else. Huh? That when you and I begin to know that he loves you more than we, anyone else on this earth could love you, that you could love yourself, then he's going to take care of you. 
And see, what starts to happening in this reality of relationship, when you and I come before him, and I know that I know that I know that he's alive, and I know that I know that I know that he loves me, then he's going to take care of me. Then I don't have to constantly be worried about myself, because he's going to take care of me. And so the only place that's going to happen, the only way, you know, those of you who are married, you know, in the beginning you used to talk a lot, Right? You know, I, 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 I love you, no, I love you more, no, you hang up, no, I ain't gonna hang up, you hang up, no, you hang up, no, 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 okay. Now it's just you can be still with each other, right? Doesn't become your love is less. It's because you know each other more. You don't have to fill it up with all kinds of talking. Now in the beginning, yes, but so when it comes to your relationship with God. So the first thing I'd encourage you, gentlemen, is decide five minutes a day with God in prayer. And in that five minutes a day, I'm just going to tell you the way I've done it for a long time and the way I teach others to do it, gentlemen. And I just did it with a bunch of men down in San Antonio two weeks ago. And I took them through the experience. I will not take you through the experience. (coughs) But again, that every day, gentlemen, you need to repent of sin. Repent. Every day you and I have sin. And primarily, gentlemen, sin is doing things our way, right? It's about, I'm going to do it my way, God. And it can even be your holiness. It can even be your walk with Christ. I'll do it my way. Gentlemen, he's not the least bit interested in you doing things your way. He wants you to do it his way. A walk with Jesus is letting him be in charge. So the first thing you do is you repent of doing it your way. And when you repent, no excuses for your sin. Don't sit there and say, you know, God, I did this because I was high. Or, you know, God, I did this because my dad wasn't very nice to me. Or, you know, I was mad. Or, you know, n- never blame your sin on anything except yourself. Take your own responsibility for your sin. Because unless you take responsibility for sin, Jesus can't heal it. He can't forgive it. Because you didn't do it. It was because of this person. And that's a very unmanly thing to do. Blame the world, right? They, they did it from the beginning, right? Adam and Eve. Eve blamed the devil and Adam blamed Eve. Nobody took a responsibility for what they did. So when you and I come before God, we repent of sin. And we say, I did it because I wanted to do it. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry I hurt others. I'm sorry I hurt myself. And again, when you and I can just be honest here, there's great humility there. You know, just, gosh, sometimes this is the way I am, God. And I'm sorry, I need you to save me. Because look what I do. And so you be honest with Almighty God. And you just ask him, and you tell him you're sorry. Simple. The second thing you got to do is you got to surrender yourself to God. Completely. Now, when I say surrender, that means you hold nothing back, right? You hold not your family back, not your sexuality back, not your psychology back, not your past back, not your uh, future back. You give everything to God on a daily basis. Now, again, the one who did this was Jesus, correct? And when Jesus said, your will be done to the Father, what happened, gentlemen? He died. When you and I do that every day, there's going to be a death to self, a true death to self. And then God will lift us up and resurrect us when we die to God's to do his will instead of ours. So again, gentlemen, what that means on a practical level, if you do this every morning and you're saying to Almighty God, I surrender my life to you today, that means in your You might have all kinds of plans today, correct? But God could change your plans. He has a better plan. So what that means is when you say, I surrender my life to you today, that means you tell me what you want to do. And I'll do it. I'll do anything you want me to do, Lord. I exist today to please you. I exist today to do your will. I give you my family. I give you my life. And, you know, I wrote a whole book on it just called Surrender. Because when you finally surrender, you'll finally get into the groove of the reality of what God wants. And you'll finally bring life to yourself and to the world. You just will. 
but it's a very unmanly thing. A lot of men says, uh, Father, I think you should na- change the name of the book. And I go, I think men need to hear this is what God's calling us to do. It takes a real man to surrender yourself to the God of the universe. That's real masculinity because you'll die. And they says, you know, I do a lot of radio uh, interviews and they'll sit there and say, well, why are men afraid to surrender, Father? And I say, because they're going to die. That's why. And men aren't man enough to die. That's the problem. They want to hold on to their life. They want to come to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, if I give you my life, this is what I want from you. Doot, 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 doot. It's not, okay, Jesus, if I give you my life, I give you everything. I'm going to die for love of you. But gentlemen, what's most important isn't what you're willing to live for. It's what or who you're willing to die for. Are you willing to die? Every day for Jesus Christ. Completely. Holding nothing back. The day you do that is the day you become a man. Because now your life is lived for another. And now God can do great things in you. So the first thing you got to do is, sir, I'm sorry every day. Repent of your sins every day. The second thing you got to do is you got to make sure you surrender every part of your life to him. And I preached on it last week. It says sometimes I think... I have fully surrendered. And then he asked me for something that I'm not willing to give up. What are you not willing to give up in your own life? That's exactly what he wants. And when you give that up, you get everything in return. But you can't follow him. He doesn't want people that only follow him a little. He says, no one can be my disciple unless you deny your very self Pick up your cross every day and follow in my footsteps. There is no room for people to only give him a little. He wants everything. So first, I sur- I'm, I'm sorry. Second, I surrender. The third thing that happens, gentlemen, and some of you, again, when I do this with men, they always go, oh, Father. Jesus said you can never enter the kingdom. You can never enter the kingdom unless you change and become as a child. How do I be a man and be a child at the same time? It's the key. Christian childhood or spiritual childhood is when you can be little before your God and God can then lift you up and make you strong. Like in my prayer, I'm very little. Huh? I know I can't take my next breath. You know, this is, it's, just, it's just reality, gentlemen. We can't even take our next breath without God saying, okay. I could be a nutty priest, pour out a machine gun, blow all your brains all over the walls. Wouldn't take much. Hit all the papers. Priest goes nuts, kills all these men. Hmm. I'd talk about it for a while. But it wouldn't take much to take your life. It wouldn't take much to take any of our lives. We are very people that are dependent upon God for every breath. Every breath, I am dependent upon somebody else. That's reality. The devil tries to say, you're strong, you're independent. That's a lie. I can prove it to you by taking a gun, putting it next to your brain, blow, pulling the trigger. I just proved to you you're nothing. You're dependent upon someone else, and that someone's almighty God. And so this God of the universe, so when you sit there and you really give that all, then you can become that spiritual childhood. And so you can look at God and say, God, embrace me, hold me, whatever it is. And then you become a little boy in your father's arms every day. We've talked about it before. Every man has a father wound. A father wound is we are never good enough for our dad. Our dad wasn't present. He wasn't there. And again, we become these victims. You don't understand, father. My dad sucked. I understand completely, gentlemen. But he wasn't your dad. You know, again, just this past week on my live call and radio talk show, a guy called on the radio and he sat there and he was from Texas or somewhere and he started with me. Now, again, I usually try to be very nice on the radio because it's EWTN and it's live and I got to watch. But this guy started with me and he said, I ain't going to call you father because the word of God says call no man father. Well, I was in a mood and I said, that's bullcrap on live radio. 
And they keep playing it back again and again and again. Because again, people sit there and they know a little bit of scripture and they think they're so smart. Well, the word of God says, well, what also does it say during that time? It says, call no man teacher is what it says. But what do you call your teacher? Teacher. So it's okay there. When Jesus said, call no man father, he sure as hell did not mean priest. And if ever you open your mouth and say that, you just show how ignorant you happen to be. He meant, because they didn't call priests, this is 2,000 years ago, gentlemen. They didn't call priests father. He meant the guy who had sex with your mother and begot you. That's who he meant called no man father huh again when I do baptisms in this church there's always a man and woman there and I say very clearly I say we all know that Joe is not the father of this child and everybody goes oh pshaw and I said who is the father of that child God no man is a father of a child he is the sacrament of the fatherhood of God and so when Jesus said, call no man father, he didn't mean this title for priest. Just so stop it. He meant that guy you call father every day. That's not your father. And those of you who have begot men and women and begot children, you're not the father of that child. God is. You're the instrument of fatherhood to them. So when you sit there and talk about my dad wasn't a good person or my father was a messed up man, the problem is you have focused on the wrong father. Your father's God. And he's perfect. And he's loved you from the beginning. He was a perfect father. The guy who was representative, maybe not. So what you got to do is you got to refocus. And instead of blaming yourself or blaming your life on your father on earth, you let the father of the universe heal you. And that's what happens in prayer. You become the child. And he says to you, why do you look at everything else when you come to pray and not look at me? Why do you focus on your past, your sinfulness, your struggles, and not look at me? Because when I, your father, look at you, I look at you with love. And so... The deepest need in everyone's heart, gentlemen, is to be loved. It's just that simple. There is no greater need. And we do everything in our power to try to fill that deepest emptiness. But the only one who will fill the emptiness is the Father. And so, if we don't feel loved, we're going to be involved in sexuality. We're going to be involved in drugs. We're going to be involved in alcohol. We're going to be involved in... All kinds of stuff. Fill in the blank that you fill in the emptiness with. It's only when you experience the true love of God in prayer that all that other stuff is like eating a piece of crap. Because that's all it is. It's crap. And you try to fill the emptiness inside with that which is not God. The only thing that will fill that emptiness is God. And so if that's the deepest need in our heart is to be loved, then gentlemen, if when you go to pray, that isn't the place you feel loved, then you're praying wrong. That ain't what it's about. If I got to beg you to go pray, if I got to say, gentlemen, you got to commit yourself to prayer because you don't know what it is yet. But once you come to know what it is, every day you'll go running to prayer because it's there that you're loved the most. It's there where your emptiness is filled. It's there that you are healed and that you are loved. And so, that's what got to happen. So, gentlemen, I'd encourage you. Every day you take at least five minutes. In those five minutes you repent of your sin because your sin can keep you from the love of the Father. He doesn't stop loving you, but it's the barrier you and I put up. So we have to put it down and say we're sorry. You surrender your life completely to him every day. And then you let yourself be a little boy in the arms of your dad. And you let the father embrace you every day. And a great way to end that prayer, gentlemen, is just with Jesus saying the prayer he taught you. The Lord's Prayer. The perfect prayer of God. 
There's no prayer more important than the prayer Jesus taught us. When the Father hears us say Jesus' prayer, he hears a prayer that's very familiar because he's the one that taught him. So we end our time with the Lord, with the Lord's prayer, slowly letting it echo through our being. And again, we do all this in the name of the Trinity and by the power of the Holy Spirit. You got it? You get it? You going to do it? Please. May you know his love today and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless, keep, and protect you, he who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.